Hi ladies and gents, welcome to this video on uh, Newton's Laws of Motion. So this is biomechanics, this is A2. Um, what do we need to know for this? Well we need to know what the three laws of motion are, but more importantly, we need to know how to apply them to sporting examples. Okay, so this has been an essay question before when they've asked you about all three. It could just be one or two of Newton's Laws for two, three, four, five marks. So you know, there are always you know, decent marks available uh, for this topic so we need to know what we're talking about so first and foremost as i said newton's got three laws number one the first law is the law of inertia okay so that all stems from what inertia is well if we have a look at the picture of this swimmer here okay she's about to dive off into the pool she has inertia at that moment in time however if she was swimming in the pool she would also have inertia at that moment in time what is inertia? It's basically a phrase or a word used to describe your current state of motion. Okay, so inertia, it could be that you are moving constantly. And what I mean by that is, I don't mean you're moving all the time. I mean moving at the same velocity. Better way of putting that, Totally, you know, ignore what I've put there. Here's the best way of putting it. If I am moving at constant velocity, I have inertia. But my inertia can also be that I am absolutely 100% still, as this swimmer is at this moment in time. So when she's still on the box, she will have inertia. When she is swimming at constant velocity in the pool, she has inertia. Okay, so inertia describes your current state. So, what does it all mean? What are we looking for in the exam? Let's say that the example is this swimmer trying to dive off the box, and the exam question says, explain how Newton's first law uh, of motion applies to this swimmer. Well, what are you going to get marked for saying? You're going to get marks for saying that first and foremost, that Newton's first law is the law of inertia. Okay, what are you going to get a second mark for saying? You're also going to get a mark for saying that big statement, but you've got to remember it. This swimmer, this performer, could be an athlete, could be a tennis player who's been a tennis player in the past. This performer, whoever they are, will remain still or move in constant motion or velocity unless a force is applied. So this swimmer here has to overcome her own inertia. She has to apply force to stop being still and to start moving. Equally, if she was in the pool swimming at constant velocity. In order to accelerate, she would have to apply a greater force than what she was already doing to get herself moving quicker, okay? So I'm gonna get a mark for saying that. She's gonna remain still, or she's gonna move with constant velocity unless another force is applied. I'll get a further mark, even simpler, by saying that this force is applied by the muscles. She, this uh, lady here, change my laser, is going to have to contract those quads, contract those glutes, contract the gastronemii to drive off the box into the water. She's going to have to apply force through her muscles to change her current state, which is still, in order to overcome her inertia and get moving. And finally, the performer will then continue in their current state until another force is applied. So, it's a bit convoluted, but let's say she jumps off the box into the water. She's overcome her inertia. She's produced a force uh, from her muscles. That has changed her current state, which was still, and she's now moving. So she's now moving through the air. She's now going to move through the air until another force is applied to her to change her current state. That force is going to be, when she hits the surface of the water, that is immediately going to slow her down. So again, her inertia has been overcome slightly, her current state of movement has been changed. Then when she gets in the water and she starts driving with her arms and her legs, she has applied another force uh, to then change her state even further. So inertia is not a constant thing. Every time you are moving or still, you have to apply force to overcome your inertia. That then means that you are now following a new path of inertia. Are you now constantly moving or are you now still? In which case, if you want to change that state, You've then got to apply another force. So it's really, really complex. It's really, really convoluted. Let's simplify it. What is it, finally? Newton's first law is the law of inertia. What does it mean? It means you will remain still or move with a constant motion or velocity unless a force is applied to you or you apply a force to yourself. 
That leads us in to the third point. When we're talking about athletes, the force is applied by the muscles, the contraction of the muscles. That then changes your state and you will now continue in that current state until another force is applied to either accelerate you, decelerate you or stop you entirely. Okay? Okay, so that was Newton's first law of motion, the law of inertia. Newton's second law of motion is the law of acceleration. Okay? Um, so this is where... A small equation comes in, okay? The equation is force equals mass times acceleration. Now, don't start panicking. You're not told to take a calculator into the exam hall with you, so you're not going to have to do an equation. It's very unlikely. However, you are going to have to know this equation, okay? Um, the weird thing is, in most physics textbooks, it will just simply say F equals ma and if you were to do a physics paper you would get away with writing that whatever reason our exam board you're not allowed to you've got to put that so if you put that you get a mark if you put force equals mass times acceleration you get nothing so please put the full term down force equals mass times acceleration right we've got a picture here of Alison Felix very very talented sprinter okay over multiple distances so what we're saying here is she has to accelerate during her event. We all have to accelerate towards something or away from someone or something during various sporting movements, okay? Um, so what can we say about this? We've got to relate this equation to Alison Felix. Now, what can we say about, let's say she's doing a 400 metres, so she's going all the way around the track. During that 400 metres, okay, mass, hair mass, this is what we're talking about here, is going to remain constant. Now, just think about that for a second. What we're saying here is, of these three things, we're talking about the law of acceleration. You're not going to have to rearrange this equation, but that's the one that we're interested in. So we know that force equals mass times acceleration. Her mass, Alison Felix's mass, is constant. It is not going to change. She might lose a gram. That's not. Remember, that's weight. We're talking about mass, how much mass she is made of. Her mass is not going to change during this event. There's only one spot in example where mass will reduce during an event. And that is in Formula One, where the car burns more petrol as it goes around. So the mass of the car reduces, it gets lighter. But they're never going to ask a Formula One question. Okay, they're going to ask about an athlete or a swimmer or a tennis player or something like that. The mass is constant. Let's say they're not even asking about an athlete. Let's say they're asking about an object, a tennis ball, a shot that someone's trying to throw as far as they can. The mass is definitely constant in that. They're not getting lighter during an event. So what we're definitely saying is you are getting a mark for saying the second law is the law of acceleration and force equals mass times acceleration. You are not going to get a mark for doing that. But you are going to get a mark for saying that the mass is constant. Of all these three things in this equation, mass is unchanging, okay? Now that makes this point a relative no-brainer. If we're looking at these, like I said, we don't have to rearrange this equation so that acceleration is at the front of it. We know we can do that, but what we're saying is, that's the one we're interested in. We want her to accelerate quicker than her opponents. Her mass is constant. It's absolutely fixed. So how is she going to accelerate greater than everyone else? She's got to apply more force into the track. She's got to push down into that ground harder. So in order to accelerate, a greater force must be produced by Alison Felix. Well, once again, what's producing those forces is muscular contractions. By contracting her muscles, she will generate more force. Therefore, she will accelerate quicker. Sorry, I forgot to tick that one as well. That's getting me a mark. That's getting me a mark as well. Tie it into scalars and vectors because it's worth an extra mark. What is the force that she's actually generating? Well, that force is a ground reaction force. She is, don't forget, applying a force downwards into the track to accelerate her forward. So the force is being produced by the muscles and that force is a ground reaction force. And finally, the greater the force, the greater the acceleration. That's what I'm going to get a mark for saying as well. So there's lots to say on Newton's second law of motion, but it all stems back to that equation. Force equals mass times acceleration. Mass is constant. It's not going to change. So in order to accelerate, you've got to produce greater forces. 
force is going to be produced by the muscles. The force that is produced is a ground reaction force. And the greater the force, the greater the acceleration. It's one of those things as well. There's always, there's always been a debate, you know, what should the build of a sprinter be? Alison Felix is a prime example. She's very, very slight. She doesn't conform to what a sprinter should be like. You know, we have this image that sprinters should be big and powerful in order to generate these very high levels of force so that they can generate high levels of acceleration. But don't forget, if you're a smaller person, you naturally have less mass, which means the forces you do need to produce in order to accelerate don't have to be as large as what they need to be for a bigger person, okay? So it's why you sometimes have these two totally different builds for sprinters, very lean, very light, but then also very big and very powerful. Their mass is constant, so they've just got to spend their careers working on developing high levels of force in order to accelerate quicker than their rivals. Finally then, what I think is the easiest one, the third law, the law of action and reaction, okay? And again, surprise, surprise, that is going to be worth a mark in the exam. So third law, notice the law of action and reaction is going to get you a mark. So what does it mean? It means that. Now, you might have heard people say this in life, you know, about karma and things like that. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Well, it stems back to physics. It stems back to Isaac Newton and his third law of motion. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So let's just make sure we're clear on what that means. The sprint start is the classic one for this. But anyone who's stood still then suddenly has to move or is moving in one direction then suddenly has to change be that running along the ground and then pushing to go vertically upwards or you know a tennis player running left along the baseline of the tennis court then suddenly having to slam on and turn right what we're basically saying is for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction Usain Bolt is pushing back into those blocks with a very very big force driven by his legs Okay, that is the action. Okay. But what are those blocks going to do? They're going to push back on him with an equal amount of force, but in the opposite direction. So there is going to be an opposite reaction. Just think about that for a second. He's going to push back on the blocks. The blocks are going to push back on him. That's why the blocks don't move. If he just pushed back on the blocks and they didn't push back on him, they would slide backwards. So they're going to push back on him with an equal and opposite force in order to drive him out the blocks. So in other words, the more force he puts back into the blocks at the start, the more force he applies backwards onto the blocks, the more force they're going to push back onto him and the quicker the sprint starts, he is going to get, okay? So there's a mark for saying that as well. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So it's the athlete that produces the force into the ground, in this case with Usain Bolt, or onto the object. Let's say it's a tennis player hitting a tennis ball. They're going to apply the force onto the tennis ball. Let's say it's a shot putter pushing the shot. They're going to apply the force onto the shot. The shot is going to apply a force equally back onto them. But it's the athlete producing the force. And I've already just quickly alluded to it there. Let's add the last point. So the final point is the ground or the object is then going to apply an equal and opposite force back onto the athlete. Okay, that's going to get me my final mark. So in other words, if you push back on something, anything, the ground, a wall, a starting block, a shot put, a javelin, it is going to apply an equal force but in the opposite direction back onto you. Okay, so they're Newton's three laws. You've got to know them and then you've got to be able to apply them to the athlete. But describing them first gets you the key marks. Okay. Good luck with it all, folks.